was going to say, so you're saying it's based out of WGBH over in Alston Brighton, Arlo, but you weren't, you weren't at in Alston Brighton. Where were you? I don't know. We, <laughs> we were down in Antarctica kind of filming this really fun series, uh, trying to get a kind of a younger audience to kind of introduce them to how exciting science can be. Uh, you know, when yeah, our desk jobs are at WGBH, and they decided, <laughs> hey, wouldn't it fun be fun to send these two people down to Antarctica and see how they do? <laughs> <laughs> did they have like a big staff meeting and just say, anybody interested, or did they just call you in and go, hey? Well, you should watch our first episode. I will. We show you how it happened. Um, but basically, going to Antarctica was maybe one of my lifelong dreams and probably beyond your wildest dreams. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, <laughs> to, to, I, I first heard that Caitlin was going on this project uh, a few months before that actually happened, and I, as soon as I heard it, I was like, that sounds like the coolest thing ever. Well, let's take a look at the trailer. We're gonna talk some more with these two. This is a clip of Antarctic Extremes. Did you know that Antarctica has a glacier that bleeds red? That ice towers grow out of the flanks of an active volcano that penguins can actually be really hard to find. Ah. Wow. My name is Caitlin Sachs. And I'm Arlo Perez. We've come to one of the most extreme environments on Earth, Antarctica. <laughs> All to find out how science is done on the coldest, windiest, most remote continent on the planet. And maybe just a bit of shenanigans. Yeah. <laughs> it got us cleaning the snowmobiles with a screwdriver. It's hard to sleep because it's always daylight. You keep waking up in the middle of the night thinking, what time is it? What's it like to live at the bottom of the world? Oh man, this is the best place in the world to be a trash man. No flies, no rats, nothing rots. What does it take to be a polar explorer? Nothing ever works exactly how you want it to. When you get here, you have to be ready for that. What are scientists discovering? Well, this is the southernmost mammal on the planet Earth. I have to say, they make some amazing sounds. We're just gonna put it in the bucket. And what happens with all the waste? They're eating your poop. They're eating it? Mm-hmm. PBS Terra presents Antarctic Extremes. A new digital series from Nova. And they're joining us here, of course, Arlo and Caitlin on Lunch Hour Live. If you have any questions or comments or anything you want to share with us, you can certainly do it on the Facebook or the Twitters. Or if you're here at the Boston Public Library, just raise your hand and we'll come over and get your question and we can have a discussion. Please join us in that discussion. Arlo, what was the most surprising thing about arriving in Antarctica? Well, from the first second, I mean, daylight. I think that's the thing that everyone gets out of it, uh, and it just blew my mind. Uh, you get there and you get just this perpetual sunset. Uh, I remember arriving and you get this four-hour sunset, and you can stand there and just look at it go through the mountains, the Antarctic mountains. And you're a photographer, so and I, this, oh was, yeah. this was like heaven for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Golden hour the whole time. Uh, I remember when we first arrived, we were just taking so many pictures and taking so much footage. And to me, that was the most awe-inspiring thing. And Caitlin, you're, you're a, a native of the region here. You're used to cold winters, right? You grew up with, with you know, some pretty dramatic extreme temperatures. I can see this is going to be a trick question. <laughs> Were you shocked or surprised or uh, about how the temperature was? I mean, I know that I've, when I've had the opportunity to go somewhere really cold, you know, uh, and I haven't been to Antarctica, but I think, well, gee, this reminds me of the Boston winter of such and such or the blizzard of 78. Absolutely shocked because I'm, I'm a hardened Bostonian. Like, I thought I got this. And we got there, and I have curly hair, and I was going to be on camera, and I kind of didn't want to wear a hat. <laughs> That didn't last long. <laughs> um, but it's not the cold, it's the wind. The wind is what will kill you. We were in negative 30 degrees, and it was fine when there was no wind. Um, yeah, because I see this, like no face masks. You're not wearing any like Yeah, there scarves. are times when you're fine, and you also adjust. Um, there's, a, there's actually an, an article on Nova's website you can check out. There's this really interesting thing where you actually start to build up more brown fat, which makes your body a more efficient heater. Also makes you ravenously hungry the entire time. So. Uh, I'm kind of like a fruits and veggie kind of girl in Boston, yep. but down there it was like cookies and pizza all the time. It was awesome. 
<laughs> now, Arlo, I understand that you were, you, you were born in Mexico, right? When was the first time that you saw snow? Ooh, uh, probably when I was 16. 16. Uh, yeah, so, so you're not that far away from 16. So this must have been a little bit of a shock to you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's one of those things like I've never, uh, I never really knew how to dress for the cold. Uh, <laughs> when I first arrived to Boston, I just had like my tiny little jacket and I kept on wondering how people were walking in the street at, <laughs> in like, you know, 20 degree weather. Like, who are these humans? <laughs> Um, so that was, the, for me, one of the biggest shocks getting down there. I mean, one of the things that happens when you're down there is you have these close encounters with, yeah. with danger. Nothing where we're actually literally about to die, but where you're just reminded about how extreme the environment was. Well, so, I want to show a clip. Like, that leads me right to my next clip, because when I saw this, this was something I was thinking. Like I, I said, when I saw you guys when you came in today, I said, I both wanted to do what you do, and I would never want to do what you do. <laughs> and this is a clip that really drove home uh, for me. This is a visit to the ice caves. Let's take a look. This is the Erebus Glacier in Antarctica. It flows off the flanks of the volcano Mount Erebus and into the frozen ocean. Seeing the glacier from space, it's massive, almost the length of Manhattan. But seeing it in person... Honestly, it's a little shorter than I expected. It's not about the height, Caitlin. It's about <laughs> the depth of the cave. Let's go. All right, we're ready. Nice. Scattered along the edges are hidden caves. And we've joined mountaineer Dennis Haskell to track them down. The caves are covered by snow. You need a good eye to find them. But mostly, there we go. a bit of muscle. All right. When we came to Antarctica, we expected to find glaciers falling apart due to climate change. But that's not what we see right here. This is wild. Whoa. Oh my gosh. Look at these crystals. Did you see these? It's so cold and calm in this cave that massive ice crystals form out of thin air. This is so cool. <laughs> and they're all over the place. They're like lining everything. The size of these crystals also indicate that this glacier is stable. The larger the ice crystal, the longer this cavern has been here undisturbed. Oh my gosh, this place is huge. It kind of opens up into a cavern. I kind of feel like we're inside the middle of a geode. Instead of a melting planet, this feels like a portal to a frozen planet. So what's going on here? To find out, we need to join a science team that's actually trying to reach an ice world far away from our own. Specifically, Europa. That's your next trip. You wrote that. <laughs> yeah, so this is really just a stepping stone for outer space. That's, yeah. that's the sequel. What was it like? What did you feel like going into those, those, that cave? I mean, oh. what were the feelings? What emotions did you have? You know, it felt like it, it, it's getting old to say it feels like another planet yeah. because everywhere we went, it really felt like what I imagined being on another planet feels like. The extra gear, the sort of science military-ish support system. Um, and the environment that's so hostile, except also so just stark and beautiful. You know, Arlo, I was struck by the visuals, um, as I'm sure you were in real life, yes. but, you know, the first thing I thought was, my gosh, it's like the movie Frozen, right? This is what, <laughs> this is what her castle looks like. Oh, this trust me, we were singing Do You Want to Make Snowman the whole time. The whole time, yeah. right? <laughs> And, and then it, it, it led me to think about CGI and, you know, uh, the, the generation, you know, that has come up watching movies and watching films and taking for granted these um, amazing visuals that you see when you go to a superhero movie or almost any movie, right? And it takes us almost a step away from the natural beauty that exists. And I, I imagine what you're trying to do with this series as well is to reconnect folks with that absolutely. natural beauty. No, absolutely. It's, it's one of those things when you, when you arrive, for example, the ice cave, it, it honestly blew all my, my expectations. Uh, as soon as I remember we walked into uh, that, in that hole, basically a hole, uh, and you see everything sparkle around you and, and just the feeling of coolness and everything, it really, it takes your breath away in, in a way that no movie could ever accomplish. And we try our hardest to kind of show it in the series uh, through kind of Caitlin and my reaction to things. Uh, because really, there, there's nothing compared to the real world. And that's what Nova does. That's, that's our mission, is to take the real world, which is 
absolutely fascinating. And um, the process of scientific inquiry and discovery, I mean, I used to want to, like, so I was telling you a little bit about Star Wars before. I loved Star Wars as a kid. I wanted to be an astronaut, go into outer space. It wasn't until I got into my 20s that I realized that right here on Earth are some amazing environments and adventures. And actually, frankly, if you want to save the world, you should be looking at the poles. <laughs> so right. our hope is to kind of help inspire um, ki kids of all ages into engaging with polar science. We're speaking with Arlo Perez and Caitlin Sachs, the hosts of Antarctica Extremes here at Lunch Hour Live at the Boston Public Radio. I'm Sue O'Connell welcoming your questions or comments. If you're here at the audience at the Newsfeed Cafe at the Boston Public Library, just raise your hand. We'll come over and get your question or just send it over the uh, intertubes and we'll talk with you about that. Talk about how long you were away, right? So you, li you live here in the, in the greater Boston area. You've got family and friends and roots and a job. And what happened? Where'd you go? Well, it took us like five days just to get there. Yeah. Um, the US research station where we were based is McMurdo Station, which is the largest research station on the continent. And it's located as far south as you can sail. The further south the ocean gets, that's why it's there, because you can ship um, supplies there, food, everything. Um, so the way to get there, though, is you've got to fly to New Zealand, so around the world, and then down from New Zealand on a military transport. So it took us a while just to get there. Then once we got to the continent, um, we were there for a month. And about a week of that was actually training on how to not get ourselves killed while we were there. But to add a little bit of that, even before we actually got to the continent, there was a fear that we wouldn't get there. There had been a delay for about a week because mm. the weather is so extreme that, that uh, they couldn't fly into it. Antarctica determines your schedule. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And uh, even, even get, kind of getting there, we, we got on board the, the military plane and there was a chance that we would have to U-turn right back to New Zealand. Was there at any spot, part, <laughs> part in this where you were just like, I thought we were making a TV show or a digital show. What what are we what are we doing? This is like I feel like I'm like going yeah. to another planet. I feel like I'm joining the military. I feel like I'm an adventurer. What am yeah. I doing? Uh, it was really interesting actually because, and this is part of the process of going to Antarctica. Um, the best laid plans get sort of thrown to the wind once you get there, uh, and that was a real challenge for us because we kind of had everything planned out and nothing really went according to plan. And what was so interesting um, to me as a science media producer is usually I arrange to have things done in a very controlled setting. And so we meet with scientists, they kind of set stuff aside for a day, let us interview them, you know, maybe we'll redo an experiment that they've already published on. We were there in the exact same boat as scientists. They wanted to get data, we wanted to get footage. And so what ended up happening is we got to experience what it really was that they experienced doing the process of science. And that was the highs and lows, the yeah. amazing environment, but also the challenge of working with a team, like a crew of three. It was me, Arlo, and a cameraman, and we had to be on camera. Right. Um, equipment failure, weather delays. And so it really gave me an appreciation for what that process of science was because we actually had to go through it. Yeah, all hands on deck sort of thing. Yeah. 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 And, and along with that, it was also the training, right? The training to literally not die. Right. It was one of those things that, uh, as First, they scare you, mind you. They, yep. they tell you uh, there are a lot of ways you can die in Antarctica. Yes. And uh, I was that's <laughs> going to be the title of your co-written memoir. Right now. There are a lot of ways to die in Antarctica. <laughs> we didn't really appreciate it before we left. It wasn't until we got there where we were like, "Oh gosh." You Jeez. have that that waiver we signed, Arlo. I just want to take, <laughs> take a look and see. All right, let's talk about some of the people that live there and work there. We're going to show a clip about just the folks that, that are doing their jobs there. This is from Antarctica Extremes. McMurdo provides logistical support for science across all of Western Antarctica and the South Pole. But most people in this town aren't scientists. Oh man, this is the best place in the world to be a trash man. No flies, no rats, nothing rots. You know, it's frozen, doesn't even really stink. They are the people who handle the trash, they are the cooks, the mechanics. Without us, without support people, there would be no science. You need this big population of 700 to 1,000 people to support maybe 300 scientists because you've got to get them where they need to go, you've got to get their equipment, their food, their water, and so forth. They're essential for the science to happen. 
but a lot of them never even get to leave the station, which looks and feels sort of like an aging mining town. It's hard to see on the surface what's so appealing about this place. People either come down their first season and say, that's it, it's a bucket list thing, and then they never come back, and there's others that just come back year after year after year. It's either just out of curiosity or adventure, or you know they just get into the community and stay with the community. I never thought I'd be doing this. I left a pretty good job to come down here, so you know it was, and I stayed. I keep coming back. What was your previous job? I worked on the space shuttle, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. No kidding. Yeah. Space shuttle with snowmobiles? Yeah, yeah, I know, it's kind of... That's really, you must really like to go. <laughs> That's such a great clip. I'm going to try to get the name of the show right, too. Antarctic Extremes, I keep adding <laughs> vowels to it. Um, so what are the people like there that are, you know, have chosen to either be there for a short term or chosen this as a way of life? I mean, they're fascinating. I mean, the community as a whole is really fascinating because it's like no place on Earth because everybody who's there chooses to be there, and if they don't choose to be there, they don't come back. So we were just as likely to meet somebody who was there for their first time as we were to meet somebody who's been there for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and I think that's a testament to the community that they've really built at that station, which um, is actually a fairly large station. We're talking about 850 to 1,000 people uh, in the summer just to support all of the science that's going on on the continent. We have a question from uh, someone in the audience. What were the things that frightened you? Ooh. Well, <laughs> I think Arlo was frightened of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, for, for me, uh, going back to training for a little bit, uh, so they, they tell you the ways to keep that, of course, and my favorite one, my favorite one by far, is they tell you that in the ice there's going to be sea, cra uh, sea cracks, right? Uh, cracks that go around the ice, and they can happen in a rectangle. Then if you're driving a snowmobile, what can happen is a seesaw effect can happen, and basically a weight goes up, you fall into the water, and then the ice lands on top of you and just encapsulates you in there. And that's, that's a delight. Yeah, that's yeah. A so, right? <laughs> so for context, we were right next to frozen oceans. So we were snowmobiling out over the ocean, and we were kind of of the mindset going down, like, oh yeah, we'll hop on snowmobiles, it'll be awesome, that was it. And they, that, one of the things that, that we learned when we got there was that that sea ice was covered in cracks. And we're like, cracks? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? 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 Nobody mentioned any cracks. So I think that was one. I was also very afraid of, of, of getting of, of yeah. exposure because uh, early on we had an experience where we were shoveling out the snowmobiles. Something that we thought was going to take about 15 minutes ended up taking about three hours. And so we hadn't dressed to be outside for three hours. I just had thin gloves, a thin jacket. And the exposure sneaks up on you too, yes, which I think and is something that you don't, most people exactly. don't understand. I didn't notice that I couldn't feel my fingers and toes until somebody, until our, our cinematographer and field director said, like, I'm getting a little cold. And then I thought, and I was like, I can't feel my toes. And, and then it, I went in and started warming up. And it was like after the experience yeah. where I started to almost have the panic attack. Uh -huh. So earlier I was saying, you have these close encounters that just remind you of how that could have been really bad, but we caught it. And they, and they taught us a lot of ways to prevent that, prevent that and catch that, which yeah. um, the National Science Foundation does a great job of preparing. Another question uh, from the audience, and you mentioned it in uh, the clip that we saw about the, the, the snow, the caves. Um, how do you think and what did you see about the global warming and how it's impacting Antarctic? Yeah. Um, so for, for context about this project, it's part of a larger part project called Polar Extremes, which in includes a two-hour broadcast film, um, which is really taking a look at how climate change is affecting the poles, past and present. And so when we were planning to go down there, one of my primary objectives was to find these stories of how the climate is affecting Antarctica. And here was the shocker. Where we went, it was actually very difficult to find those stories because we were so far south that it a lot of the science being done there was um, not seeing the effects of climate change the way parts of Antarctica further north are. So when we talk about climate change uh, in Antarctica, a lot of ice melting, we're talking about places near the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, the Thwaites Glacier is a glacier that is, it, it, that's the glacier that's keeping scientists up at night right now, um, and it should be keeping you up too. Um, but that was hundreds of miles away from us. So uh, 
there was some team, there were some teams sort of preparing to go out to that glacier. There were a lot of baseline studies looking at populations that were actually doing well, uh, penguin populations, seal populations, to compare to further north. But a lot of uh, the bad stuff that climate change is doing is ha was happening in a part of the continent that was not where we could access. And in a way, I think that's, that sort of gives you a window into what we need to preserve, right? Exactly, you know? yes. Uh, a yeah. lot of canary in the coal mine there. Uh, for, the, uh, for example, the penguin colony there is doing quite well, and when you compare it to other colonies up north, you can tell how poorly the ones up north are doing. Right, yeah. and, and the seal colony as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually want to throw to a, a clip of some of, we're, we're talking about a lot of uh, ice and snow and snowmobiles and danger. Uh, Will Robinson, but we also <laughs> want to take a, a look at some of the animals that are there, and this is a great clip. You're going to love your seals after you see this. <laughs> when you think about where we're living and what that pup is about to face, only about two out of ten will survive to be adults. The scientist part says, I hope you get all the help you can. That's one of the things we're studying is all the things mothers do for their babies. So we're trying to figure out the recipe for success. These female seals are very faithful to these places for their pupping. So they'll come in and during October and then they'll be here and raise their pups for a month. To figure out the recipe for seal success, Jay and his team tag the newborn seals. I can see her tag numbers. She's wearing a pair on each of her hind flippers. And this allows them to track the seals through their lives. When did this female start breeding? Which years did she have pups or not have pups? What were the ice conditions like? Try to figure out why are some years better for making babies than others. In the last 50 years, they followed over 25,000 seals. And that has allowed them to learn a lot about this population. They look kind of cumbersome up here. You know, they kind of flop along their belly to move around. But when you see them in the water swimming, they become these athletes. And you realize, yeah, they have this very dual existence. These seals spend a lot of their lives in the water. Here they fight for territory, look for food, and apparently sing. I have to say, they make some amazing sounds. Yeah, they make some canary chirps. And they make some big booms. Really great sounds. It's almost like they're singing these bird songs in their water. Or are the seals and the birds singing the seal songs? Oh, <laughs> oh deep thoughts. So talk about otherworldly, you know, and you know these guys are eating pizza, so they're they're nice and warm and they've got the right kind of brown fat going on there. What other kind of animals are there? What you what did you encounter? Someone wanted to know from the audience if you saw any snow bears. There, there are no polar bears there in Antarctica. Which I was very disappointed about. I have to there say. are penguins, and there are no penguins in the Arctic, but polar bears are an Arctic, an, are an Arctic creature. So we saw, we saw penguins and seals, and, um, we, uh, and, and divers that we worked with shared some footage with us mm -hmm. of a whole bunch of really cool undersea creatures, um, massive, giant, sea spiders and jellyfish and sea slug things. Um, and also we met with some biologists who are studying uh, little tiny microscopic critters that we couldn't see with our bare eyes um, that are actually uh, in environments analogous to places like Mars. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at those to try to better understand what we might find on other planets. One of uh, our audience members wants to know, you touched on this a little bit, but um, knowing the uh, ins and outs of production, right? Uh, you're on a deadline, there's a budget item for how long you're going to be there, there's an expectation of what you're going to bring back. How, how did you deal with uh, unexpected issues like equipment failures, equipment changes, schedule changes? I mean, you know, I know physically you just adapted and did it, but emotionally, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get out there and do what you want to do to bring uh, to the show and at the same time have to, you know, fix yeah. things. Yeah. That was, I would say that was one of the hardest parts of the whole production. Um, you know, we, we went there and, and at least uh, for me, uh, I didn't know the cameraman as, as much. Uh, Caitlin actually had experience with him before, but for me, he was a complete stranger. And we went from not knowing each other to, you know, literally sleeping next to each other for a month. They were roommates. We were yeah. roommates, yes. <laughs> uh, so it's one of those things that, uh, 
you just have to kind of put in the mentality of like this is going to be a month and slowly you start becoming a really close-knit team and, and relying on each other's strengths and when something fails you know you just uh, each one of them puts their strength in and just finds the best way to overcome it and we didn't really sleep very much yeah that, <laughs> that too <laughs> Kaylin was very one of, happy one of the things we did was um, because we were both um, hosting it and kind of producing it, yeah. uh, there are pretty limited times when Arlo and I are on camera together because usually one of us was holding the booth <laughs> right, microphone right. pole. To do um, it, to sort of do it as your, do it yourself kind right. of Right, and yeah. we had to sort of kind of uh, work on the fly a bit and, and uh, so. All right, one of our audience member, members wants to know what your, your next adventure is. What, what's the, if you could pick any adventure to work on your next uh, series, what really? where would it be? <laughs> well, I really want to do Saharan Extremes. You know, I I, I think that's a, that's a, it has a nice ring to it. But uh, I'm not crazy about this because one of the nice things about Antarctica, no bugs, no <laughs> snakes, nothing poisonous. Um, I, Sahara sounds kind of sweaty, but <laughs> I don't know. There's camels, there's desert, there's pyramids. I'm just like, can make it I want to be in this pitch meeting when it happens. <laughs> so tell, tell me a little bit about the digital uh, only aspect of it. Like this, this is a different sort of branch on the Nova tree, if you will, right? Yeah. So where can folks see this, um, and and what's your background bringing it, bringing your expertise to it? Um, so my background is on working on Nova's broadcast documentaries that you see on, on television. Uh, Arlo's background is from the digital side, and this is really um, uh, maybe one of the first first time Nova's done this. It's a kind of a hybrid between the two. What what is our long form documentary and sort of more digital? It's a little more irreverent. Um, it's a little more webby, uh, but it also doesn't compromise on things like production quality, rigorous scientific storytelling, because uh, uh, we th we think that digital audience is growing up and wants that qual kind of quality. Uh, science documentary content just on the digital platform. So you can watch it on um, uh, PBS, uh, Terra, the PBS's new science YouTube channel, Terra, which uh, will be launching next week. Uh, this will be the very first series on that channel. Uh, it'll also be on uh, the PBS app, on Nova's website and Facebook page. And I also want to add, if uh, you're uh, into gaming, there's also a companion game so if you want more baby seals in particular, <laughs> there is a whole module. Uh, this is kind of an educational game, but it is so much fun. There's like a f almost, well. <laughs> um, can't spoil it. I can't spoil, can't spoil it. it. You do have to make it to the third level to get to the baby seals. Um, but that's called the Polar Lab, and that's on Nova's lab platform. I believe that might be launching today uh, into beta. So if you are a hardcore gamer and want to help us beta test it, um, you can check that out probably tonight or tomorrow, and then next next week it'll it'll be fully. And and you had a you have a blog that's up as well at uh, at the website, right? That that was sort of as you were experiencing yeah. it. So that was written as we were down. Like I was yeah. actually writing those as I was as I was down there. Um, so if you want kind of a sneak peek at what the series will be, uh, go check out that uh, we call them dispatches uh, and. There's some, some nice photography from Arlo. I kind of gave the inside story of what the production was like. Um. <laughs> <laughs> As it was happening. As it was and happening. Just looking back on it saying, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. It's, I can't wait to see the entire series. It's congratulations to both of you. It is both fun Thank and you. informative Thank and it looks so, so beautiful that I know no matter what screen someone is watching it on, uh, it will be very, very rewarding. And I hope you guys come back, and I can't wait to see what the next adventure is. I want to see <laughs> wins. This is exciting. Thanks so much to Arlo Perez, Caitlin Sachs. They are the hosts of Antarctic Extremes over at Nova. All that great stuff is there. Thanks so much for joining us again here at Lunch Hour Live. I'm Sue O'Connell at the Newsfeed Cafe at the Boston Public Library. Thanks to everybody and everybody in the audience for coming down today. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks for watching.